it was partly pig ignorance. I, I couldn't believe I couldn't do it. And just sheer grit determination. So welcome to another episode of the Every Mind podcast here with Vicky Shanks and we're going to dive into your story in a minute if you don't mind. Okay. Um, but firstly, what do you do now and let's talk about how you got to where you are today. Oh, that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I do now mostly is um, a lot of awareness for mental health, suicide prevention, wellness, um, autism, communication, anything really to do with people and how they interact and, and what can help them. So I do a lot of um, keynote speeches for companies and universities and schools and things. Um, but I also do quite a lot online, trying to sort of raise awareness and put things out there that may not always get put out there. I like to be mm. a little bit controversial sometimes because that gives you a lot of feedback and also gives you a lot of ideas about what people are actually thinking. Yeah. So I, I asked on LinkedIn the other day what people thought about humour within mental health issues. And I got some great answers back. It was absolutely brilliant. Mm. So it, you know, it's just putting it out there and trying to find out what people really, really are thinking. Yeah, instead of making assumptions. You know? Of course, yeah, and I think it's just awareness, education, and then yeah. of course, your personal experience. Right? I'm guessing a lot of the talks are around personal experience. A lot of them. Are. I mean, a lot of what I've been doing recently is about resilience and mental health and well-being, but it always incorporates my story because mm. a lot of you know, I don't have a qualification, so I come from very much a point of view of direct experience. So people always want to hear my story because they want to know how I've been resilient enough to get through everything and how I've done it and what strategies have I used and all of that kind of thing. And also, they want to know about the children and all of their difficulties and how they've come through and what I've done to help them, etc. So let's talk about where it all started. So obviously, I think well, the first time we met was at the the screening of Kingdom of Us. Yes. So that's a documentary on Netflix yeah. that, um, I guess, follows the family for a period of time yeah. after obviously losing your husband to suicide. Yeah. Um, so firstly, if we can just look at that, how did how did that all come about, and how did that sort of, you know, it must have been a difficult time, let alone having you know. The camera's there as well. Yeah, it was, but it's funny, you know, we weren't approached by Netflix who said we want to make a film about it, because people always think, well, they must have come to us and we want to make a film about you, and then, you know, camera crews were everywhere, and it just didn't happen like that. It, it started as a documentary for the BBC about autism, and the children were all up for it, so we said, yeah, let's go ahead, and then we met the director. Then the BBC messed around, but by that time she felt that she had found something that she was passionate about and felt that there was something in our story that could really help people. And then Pulse Films came on board, because it was Royal Cup TV initially, and then Pulse Films came on board. And they decided it shouldn't be a documentary, it should be a film. Mm. So the emphasis of the filming changed slightly, although it was still Lucy sort of sitting in corners and catching moments, because none of it's staged. We refused to do it if it was all going to be staged. You know, None of this knocking on the doctor's door going, hi! You know, yeah, talking yeah. to the last time there. Um, and then in the three years of filming, because it was a long time and Lucy mm. filmed a huge amount of footage, but during that time, somehow Netflix found out about it, and I still don't know how. And whenever I talk to Pulse or anyone else, they don't seem to quite know how either, but suddenly Netflix came on the scene and said, we want this film. Mm. And before we knew what was going on, it had gone from something we thought might be seen in a few arts theatres around the country, but or maybe on TV once or twice, to suddenly it was going to be available to a global audience of hundreds of millions of people. Mm. And it was a bit, oh, you know, because there's lots of things in that film that everyone's uncomfortable with. Yeah. You know, there are bits that Pippa doesn't like it because it becomes a very, very difficult part of her life. And there are things in there that I wouldn't necessarily have told the world, but, we insisted it had to be brutally honest and raw, otherwise we weren't going to do it because we couldn't see the point. Yeah, and I think that's so important when it, with, with mental health or yeah. a story like that, you can't, you know, it has to be raw, it has to be authentic. It does, and so much of what we see on TV and films about mental health, a lot of it is so sugar-coated mm. 
and so sort of softly, softly that you don't really get the essence of what's actually happening. And in order to make differences and for people to understand more, we have to get down to the absolute nitty gritty and that's what I've always been all about. And yeah. since Paul's death, I've always been totally open about life because it does help people to know that they're not the only one that has these challenges. Mm. And with the, with, the, with the film, I remember, obviously we did the screening together yeah. and um, I think I first met you at the Wagamamas beforehand, yes. introduced to the seven yeah, children yeah. and, you know, it was immersed, mad, wasn't it? Yeah, it, was <laughs> it was immersed straight away and I was very welcomed straight away. And then it was, if I'm honest, the first time I'd seen the film, sitting there mm. with all of you in the cinema and hearing times where a few of the children were upset and um, it was actually you know very difficult for me to watch it obviously experiencing suicide grief myself yeah and I think a key thing that I found from the film was how all of your children dealt with the grief very differently the same way you dealt with the grief yeah. very differently so talking about grief I think a lot of people you know everyone has to deal with it at some point What's the kind of differences that you saw in, in how your youngest, your eldest dealt with it? And if you've got any tips yeah. for anyone dealing with grief? I think there's a perception. I mean, there are always perceptions on every subject, but I think there's a general perception about grief that it's a linear thing. So you're grieving and you're down here and gradually you get better and it's a straight line. And I think with suicide, the grieving process is very, very different because if someone has an accident or they die through illness, you can say, well, it was an accident, you know, what could we have done? Or they had cancer, there's not a lot we could have done to prevent that. With suicide, there's always that question of, could I have said something? Could I have done something differently? And all of the children have questions around the day it happened about whether they should have done that instead of this, or should they have been quicker? or what could they have done to prevent it from happening? Mm -hmm. As I do have those questions as well. So I think when you're grieving about, I mean, grief is never a straight line anyway. You know, you'll, you'll feel a bit better and then something will happen and you'll drop down because there's always an element of PTSD with any grief under any circumstances. So it doesn't take much to feel okay one minute and then go, oh, and a piece of music or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think with suicide, the problem is that you you start to feel a bit better, and that's normally because you're busy, and then it becomes quiet, and then those questions start coming back, and the guilt starts coming back. Mm -hmm. However much people say, there's nothing you could have done, you shouldn't feel guilty, you don't need to feel guilty, you can't help it because you can't help asking those questions, and they're questions you will never get answers to. So they never go away. Mm -hmm. So with the children, some were in total denial for a long time, and I think for Casey, it's only just hit her now, if I'm going to be honest. Um, some of them really just went into a deep depression. Some of them used a lot of humour, very inappropriate humour sometimes, but that was their coping strategy. Yeah. Some of them immersed themselves in things that they may not have been particularly interested in, but they were things that they could get caught up in, which would take their mind off things. So they all had very different coping strategies and I've watched them all, you know, some of them grieved a lot at the time and some of them didn't really grieve at all until months or years after and then it takes a trigger mm -hmm. and with Casey, she had a, a breakdown a couple of years ago which was related to a boy she'd been going out with and of course we went to the crisis team because she was suicidal mm -hmm. and the crisis team, all they heard was that she'd broken up with her boyfriend. And all they said was, well, you know, everyone has breakups, so, you know, you'll be fine in a while. But it wasn't about that. It was about the abandonment. And that brought back the feelings from, well, Paul killed himself mm -hmm. because all the children feel as though they weren't worth sticking around for. Yeah. And I think that's another thing that happens when it's suicide is, well, weren't we worth staying here for? Couldn't mm -hmm. you have found a way around it so that you could be with us? Yeah. So you've got all these additional emotions going on when someone dies by taking their own life. It's yeah. not the same as someone dying through illness. I can relate to all of that. And it's, I think someone explained it as grief with the volume turned up sometimes. Yeah. It's, you know, a yeah. rocky road. Now with all of that, one of the things that stood out to me since knowing you is um, how you manage it all. You know, 
I'm a parent now and it's hard enough with two, let alone seven, and yeah. you know, the difficulties that you face with them and then, you know, losing Paul and doing these talks and yeah. How do, how, how do you manage it? That's the question. Um, I get asked that an awful lot. Mm. And I think the only answer I can give is, it was partly pig ignorance. I, I couldn't believe I couldn't do it. And just sheer grit determination. Mm. And the strategies I learned, I never looked in my diary until the day before. So I'd get into bed and go, right, what's going on tomorrow? And I'd often have four or five appointments with the children for different things because three of them have statements and I didn't start that process until Paul died. And with the two with cerebral palsy, obviously there were hospital appointments and operations and all sorts of things going on. So I'd look in my diary the day before and then do a kind of a logistical analysis of how I was going to manage the next day. And the truth of it is that I used to, because I was still running the business as well, mm. so I would often be up until three or four in the morning doing invoices and catching up with paperwork and then I'd be up again at 6.30 getting the kids up. So it was a hell of a process. And to be honest, when I look back, because I've got all my old diaries and sometimes I flick through them, not very often, it's a bit daunting, but I flick through them and I think, you know, I was just, I was 100% solution orientated mm. because that was the only way I could do it. I couldn't focus on the problems. I had to focus on the solutions. I, I didn't have a choice. Mm. And that was probably one of the things that got me through more than anything else. And accepting that there was a lot of small stuff going on that didn't matter, that I could just ignore. And I had to because I didn't have time to worry about someone spilling milk on the floor. It was just totally irrelevant. It was a quick wipe and move on. So I think when you're that busy, you just, you just don't, you haven't got the capacity to think about things that really don't matter. Mm. So I just kind of did it. But I was on the go the whole time. I never, ever stopped. Has it been an adverse effect to that, a negative effect in a way as well, where yeah, I think so, yeah, so many people, yeah. you know, they try and be superhuman and help everyone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had a heart attack two years ago, mm. which was totally stress related, um, because it wasn't just the children and looking after them and running the business and everything else. It was the financial situation I was left with, which was horrific. And trying to get on top of that and trying to sort that out and all of that worry. And then HS2 came along and they go right outside our house and all the stress of that. And yeah, so I have heart disease and that's all stress related. I've got a, a digestive problem, which is all stress related. And I need an operation for that. So yes, it has. It has had an effect. But my, my children all had special needs and they all needed me. And there was no way I could fail them because I was threatened three times by social services that they would take the children away because they thought I couldn't cope. Mm. So I had to prove to them that I could cope and I could keep on top of things. And I didn't think about the future repercussions. Yeah. I just got on with it, you know? You do what you have to do to be able to sort of manage yeah, that do. stress at the time. you do. And I think if you've got children, and don't forget, they've been through a horrific experience. So you know, Paul committing suicide when they were so young mm. was horrendous, especially when you take into account the autism and all of the other difficulties they've got. It was such a difficult time for them that I, I couldn't fail them. I just, I, my sense of responsibility was so enormous that, mm. that it wasn't a choice. Yeah. That's a, it just wasn't a choice. And with your TED Talk, you know, it's an amazing TED Talk and you, you, you. speak about the children and... Um, autism and how we look at autism, you talk about the spectrum, can you kind of elaborate on, on that as well? I have very strong views on um, not just people with different brain wiring, but also people with different body functions. To, I hate the word disabled, I hate it, because to disable something is to render it useless, and I've yet to meet a person in a wheelchair or with mental health issues who's useless. I, I just haven't met one, so I hate that word. But I think what we're only starting to understand, and we've got a long way to go, is that actually mankind needs people who think differently. And 
actually we all think differently because my brain doesn't work the same as yours or anyone else's. So actually, I say to people sometimes who talk about neurotypical people, I say, well, can you introduce me to a person who is neurotypical? And they'll go, well, then they'll say, well, okay, so do they think the same way you do? Because we're generalising. Mm. And you can't generalise because we're all so different. So what we need to understand is that people with neurodivergent brains, so whether you're talking about autism or dyslexia or bipolar or schizophrenia, it doesn't matter. If you look back historically, a lot of these people have done incredible things for mankind. And we wouldn't be where we are now if it wasn't for people with very different brain settings, if you like. Mm -hmm. So we really do have to start thinking about people in a different way and looking at them for the assets they are and not the things they lack. Because so many people get sidelined, especially autistic children mm -hmm. get sidelined, because people see their limitations, not their strengths. And we have to stop that. We have to start seeing what strengths people have, mm -hmm. whatever their challenge may be. Because we're losing out on a huge resource by not recognising that that person may not think the same as me and he may not be as socially aware as I am, but his brain is incredible at seeing patterns. So how can we utilise that and help him to feel worthwhile, but also society benefits as well. Yeah, and I think we've spoken about it before, and where we're trying to put people in boxes all yeah. the time, you know, oh, they've got autism, this person's suffering with depression, and we're putting them in boxes, and you sort of, we've both said, we can't, you can't do that. It's a completely individual approach to everyone who's yeah. experiencing something different. Yeah. So I'm guessing you've seen that with, with your children, yeah. you know, the approach to them with autism, I'm guessing it's completely different. Oh, yeah, no two are the same. Mm. And that's another problem that we're experiencing, and it's still it kind of started with Rain Man, and then everyone thought, oh, autistic people are all geniuses and mm. can do math in the head and things, which of course isn't, you know, some can, but not everyone. And I think we're still struggling with some preconceived ideas that have been created by the media. Mm. Um, the A word for me was so damaging watching it, having brought up so many autistic children, that I, I, I had to watch it because I run an autism support group. And I thought, I've got to watch this because people kept asking me, and I thought, damn it, I don't really want to see it. But I watched it and I thought, no, this is actually not helpful mm. because there are too many generalisations in it. And there are a lot of books written by autistic people and because they do tend to have quite rigid thinking, a lot of the books are written, all autistic people this, all autistic people that. And that's mm. not the case. And bringing up my own and seeing the incredible differences between them is unbelievable. Yeah. You know, what works for one doesn't work for everyone else. It all has to be very individually tailored. And our education system doesn't do that. And unfortunately, parents aren't very often educated well enough to know what they need to do to make the difference. Yeah, and I think it's exactly the same with you know mental illness and yeah. you, you mentioned education. Do you think that's the catalyst of how we're going to change our approach to this? No, I think I think it all starts at home. I think parenting needs to change. But in order for that to happen, parents need to be better educated. Mm. And then education and school is the second line of defence, if you like, where children will be helped. But all the while we have an education system that is a sausage machine, and if you, you don't fit into that machine, then mm. you, you need extra help, or you don't always get that. And, you know, education isn't tailored to individual children. And that's a difficult... Any teachers who watch this will go, oh, you can't do that with 30 kids, and I absolutely accept yeah. that. But to teach 30 children all in exactly the same way doesn't work because we all receive information in different ways. Mm -hmm. And the breakthrough for Nikita was going to special school. And instead of a teacher standing at the front and talking to them and then expecting them to write something down, which she couldn't do, she had such a lowered receptive language score that when she went to special school, she came home, and this had never happened. I used to ask her every day what she'd done at school and she would say, I don't know. And she honestly didn't know. Mm -hmm. 
And then she came home from school one day at a special school and walked in and immediately said, did you know that Anne Frank? And she told me the whole story of Anne Frank. And I said, well, how do you know all that? And she said, well, there's a little lobby area outside the classroom and the teacher made all of them go and sit in there. So she was at special school, it was only 10 of them. Mm. But she said, this is what Anne Frank did. And she had a little pencil and they had to go to the loo there and told them the whole story. But because they were experiencing it, experiencing it, she took it in mm. and was able... I didn't, I didn't know as much about Anne Frank as she did. It was fantastic. <laughs> but but it's that just that shift in approach, her. you know. It is. And, you know, schools could have, instead of streaming, they could have a class of children who learn by reading, a class of children who learn by doing, etc. And that would be a much more efficient way of teaching our children because they would be able to access more information if they're being taught in the way they mm. learn best. Yeah. But it won't happen because governments don't want to make radical changes because they're only in yeah. power for four or five years. Yeah, and I think, again, so you know, it's, that's a challenge, isn't it? And yeah. I'm guessing the stuff you're doing on social media and blogging and the documentary or the film and is the aim of that, the awareness that will hopefully change the perception of... Oh, I'd love to. I mean, I, I would love to change everyone's perception about everything, mm. really. But it, it's very, very difficult because the, there is an element of people who don't really want to know. Mm. So you're trying to teach people who really don't want to be taught. And, you know, government party politics, I don't think, work anymore. But when you've got a government that's only in power for four or five years and you need a plan that will take 50 years to see the results, there aren't many people who are prepared to... Yeah to put their money behind that because you can't see instant results and that's what governments want. Yeah. And of course it's got to come from, the, the government has to change things, it can't be done by people. We can all do our best to raise awareness but we can't change the overall system of mental health and, and schools etc. Mm. And do you think that translates in, into the workplace as well? You know, some of the work you've done inside of, of companies, mm. do you feel like they have that same sort of approach as well, where it's kind of short-term minded, we don't really want to talk about mental health because of yeah, it's a I big do. challenge. And I think the, one of the biggest challenges with people in employment is that they're frightened to be open about their mental health mm. issues because they're scared of losing their jobs. Mm. And to be honest, I mean, you know, a lot of my children have been under the mental health system in various different ways. Pippa was in hospital for a long time and she's since experienced being in an adult psychiatric unit, which was a very different ball game to the yeah. adolescent ones. And the reality is that apart from medication and counselling and therapy, which work for different people in different ways and don't work for some people at all, there isn't much that can be done to help people. Mm. And I spoke at um, Cambridge University earlier this year and a lot of the students were saying, the university's got, to do, university's got to do this, that and the other. And I said to them, yes, the university has got to do as much as they can. But the first port of call is you mm -hmm. and taking self-responsibility for your health and well-being. Because if you're not eating well and not sleeping well and you're totally stressed out, I mean, the uni can do a lot to take a lot of that pressure mm -hmm. off. Um, but if you're not looking after yourself, then what can the experts really do? Mm. You know, it has to start with the individual. And I feel very passionately about that because I think we're entering an era where people expect other people to pick the pieces up for them and miraculously make them better. And I know from experience that, that doesn't happen. Mm. And it can't happen because there is no miracle cure mm. for mental illness, depression, etc. It doesn't exist. So you have to look at yourself in the first instance and make sure you're doing all the right things and then you can look for external help and yeah. medication or whatever's available. And I think that's very empowering for, for people to, when they hear that. You know, if I'm an employee, I haven't really got much control, I'm waiting for the company to make some changes, it's very powerless. But you know, now I'm empowered to go and hopefully yeah. make some change and yeah. you know reduce the stigma in the workplace and yeah absolutely and i think companies can do a lot i think they can do a lot by allowing people to be more open mm. i think that's a big one in the workplace mm. but beyond that 
And I think it, it comes down to a lot of other things as well when you're talking about big companies. And I did some research, funnily enough, because I did talk for Warwick Uni about effective communication. And in that research, I found some research that had been done, enormous research, we're talking millions of people in thousands of companies. And what the research found is that the people on the ground floor, so for example, if it's a delivery company, the people, the drivers and the people sorting the packages felt that effective communication was really vital, about 92%. And then middle management, about 81%, so I can't remember the exact numbers, felt that it was important. You get up to upper management, up to the executives, and only 65% mm. of those people felt that really, really good communication was essential for the smooth running of the company. Now, that has to change, mm. because if you've got people in your workforce who are autistic or suffering from various mental health issues, your communication has got to be extremely good, extremely clear. Because if people don't know what's expected of them, of course they're going to be anxious and stressed. And you know, if you don't know what's expected of you, then how can you possibly know yeah. that you're doing the right thing? So that ethos has to change as well. So mental health isn't just about a company saying, well, there's a free gym membership or <laughs> doing mindfulness sessions or saying, come and talk to me about your depression. It goes a lot deeper than that. It's culture, changing the culture. Absolutely, yeah, culture change. Do you think um, social media plays a part in that as well? You know, do you, especially when you've got you know young girls. Do you think that impacts it as well? Because we're looking at different versions of you know people and comparing ourselves. I don't think necessarily. I think it's very easy to blame social media for most things, mm. and I think these days social media does get blamed for yeah, that yeah, a lot. Yeah. And it's not really fair because I read a thing on um, Facebook the other day that said being uh, being offended by something. On, you see on the internet, it's like stepping in dog shit instead of walking around it. Mm. And the same goes for everything. It doesn't have to be on the internet. I like that. You know, yeah. you choose. You know, am I going to walk in it? Am I going to walk around it? Walk around it. You know, if it upsets you, walk around it. Mm. And I think that goes back to resilience. That people, I think people almost want to be offended. Mm. You know, there are times with my kids where I think you're enjoying being offended. You know, mm. this isn't about you actually feeling these feelings, but it's like a part of their identity almost. Mm. And I don't know, I don't think it's necessarily social media. I think we're being we're being fed information in so many different ways. And I think there are a lot of sitcoms, um, I mean I don't watch EastEnders and things like that, but I think there's a lot of information coming through there that's influencing a lot of people. Mm. And yeah of course social media plays a part because people put up opinions and people comment on them. So it's all input. You know, our brains are computers, so everything that we see and hear, it goes in, whether we're conscious of it or consciously remember it, it's still in there. Mm. And it will shape us unless we're aware of that and we're more mindful about what we choose to allow to shape us. And I think with young people, they don't have that awareness yeah. and they don't know that they need that awareness. And maybe that's part of what we should be doing is teaching them you know, you have to choose sometimes what you want to take in. And I think, again, it's personal responsibility, isn't it? You know, it you, is, you're yeah. responsible for what you're seeing on social media, how yeah. you're using it, rather than social media, I guess, um, I mean, being the problem. that's the difference between when I was growing up and now. Mm. You know, it, there was a huge feeling of personal responsibility. If you tripped up a curbstone, it wouldn't occur to someone to sue anyone. Mm. You should have been looking where you were going. And that was the... The, 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 the basis of society, if you like, that mm. you did something and you hurt yourself, it was your fault. Whereas now, if you trip over a curbstone, people are looking, oh, well, I'll sue the council for mm. that. You know, we have this totally different mentality to everyday life. And I don't think it's healthy. Mm. I think we need to get back to a point of view where I'm responsible for what I do. Mm. You know, that's down to me. Yeah. And it's not down to anyone else. But I think it's going to take a lot to turn it around. Exactly. I think we've got a long it's, way down that line. I think you mentioned it as well. It's going to take a huge amount of time, isn't it, to change the whole perception of yeah. of, of of everything that we're kind of discussing yeah. here. Um, I kind of want to sort of summarise and, and wrap up with a question that's sitting on my mind about... Again, it's a question I get a lot when I do talks, is, is supporting other people. Um, 
and obviously you've had to do that and you've obviously had you know Paul and mm -hmm. if someone's kind of listening to this or watching this and, and they really are struggling to support someone whether it's at home or inside of work what kind of advice can you give them? Well I have I struggle with depression mm -hmm. terribly and all of my children do but we <laughs> We all live at home at the moment, so all eight of us are at home, but Casey, my daughter, went out a couple of years ago and bought this handmade, bespoke mug, cost her a fortune, and that's the crisis mug. Now, whenever anyone's in crisis, we make them a tea in the crisis mug and give it to them, because that's our way of acknowledging that they're in a bad place. Mm. Then everyone who's in will sit with them and they can talk if they want to or you know maybe split up with a boyfriend recently and she just wanted to watch a film she didn't want to think about it it was too hard at that point so our way of helping each other within the family is to just say yeah we're here for you whatever you need we're here for you mm. but also it's it's not just about being there for, i think within the workplace a valuable thing and this is a difficult one because if I, come, if I worked with you and I came in and said, hi Paul, how are you? Your instant answer would be, yeah, I'm fine. Mm. Now we do that not for no other reason except that we know the other person doesn't really want to hear half an hour sure. of what's going wrong, mm. right? And most of us don't. And we have, to, we have to change our attitude towards people who are struggling as much as people who are struggling need to be more open. So in an office situation, if you walk in and someone says, yeah, I'm fine, and you look at them and think, you know if someone's fine or not. Mm. You know, it doesn't take much more than saying, do you fancy coffee? Mm. Or do you want to join me for lunch? Or do you know what I mean? It just, yeah. that sort of, I'm there for you. And it happened to me at the autism group, a lady walked in and she sat in the corner, which she never does, she's always very sociable. And I went and spoke to her and a lot of things came out. And she said, I haven't told anyone this. And but it was so valuable, the month, next month she came back and she was so much better and she said, just you knowing I wasn't all right and mm. getting me to talk made so much difference. Mm. And I think that's one of the keys in society is to stop judging people and not caring and being prepared to give them just a few minutes of your time to allow them to talk if they want to. Some people don't want to, but if they need to get something off their chest, just give them a few minutes or just say to them, are you sure you're all right? Mm. You know, that awareness that actually, I don't think you are, and do you want to talk about it, can make a huge, huge difference. And especially from bosses, you know, if your mm. supervisor spots it, that can make people feel so much better that people are aware and care enough about them to ask them. Yeah, I think it's compassion over solutions, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, again, with dad it was purely solutions like come on you know do this yeah. do this but really at that moment i'm guessing all you want is compassion you just want someone to to be there and i think i think that also seems sometimes seems too simple for people to grasp so it's really good yeah. that you kind of you know but it's also up. it's having someone to just say to you you know it's all going to be okay yeah because at moments like that you think this is never going to be okay mm. and someone outside saying it's all going to be all right mm. can be very very powerful and I know with the children, just hearing that from someone that matters, you know, very often that's me because I'm mum, but hearing that from me is, is very empowering for them. Mm. We could have this conversation for a long, long time. We could, couldn't we? <laughs> but just um, to sort of wrap up, let everyone know where they can find out a little bit more about you. Oh, everywhere. Um, <laughs> the, <coughs> excuse me, the film Kingdom of Us is on Netflix. Very recommended to watch as well. Yeah, actually, the Royal College of Psychiatrists recommend nice. everyone watches that who's interested in mental health. So that's that's great. Yeah. Uh, my book Unraveled is on Amazon. That's really all about coercive control and my relationship with Paul. So that's quite a an, in, an interesting read for anyone who feels they might be in a, a relationship that's not quite right. Uh, my TED talk is on YouTube, Why My Autistic Children Don't Need a Cure. And that's great because that gets shown in a lot of colleges and schools and universities all over the world, which is what I wanted for it. Amazing. And the, the autism community love it, which is great because it means I said, you know, my attitude and what I said was the right thing. 
and then I'll just you know Google Google me stuff mm. everywhere, <laughs> and we'll link <laughs> like up to it as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, honestly, you know, hugely inspirational as when we first met, and you know, stayed in touch since. So keep doing what you're doing, and hopefully the kids are all right. So. And you keep doing what Hats you're off doing. To you. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for listening, and please let us know what you think in the comments below. And thank you to Vicky once again. Thank you very much, Paul. It's been a pleasure. No worries.